Good morning, everyone. So excited again to be here. It might be raining inside, but it's warm inside. Got to my car this morning, and I don't, I, my body is not prepared for minus 40 anymore. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I got in my car, it was 10 degrees, and my heat was blasted because I was so cold. And I know that that's still hot, right? Like, we live in Alberta, Canada, where if it's 10 degrees, like, if it was 10 degrees in, like, March, we would be wearing, like, T-shirts, but now I'm, I'm like, I have to wear a jacket this morning. It is freezing cold outside. Because this year we experienced minus 40 and almost plus 40 within six months. And it's just like unbelievable. I don't think the human body was created to live in this kind of environment. But we, we are learning and we're adapting and we're growing. And we now can overcome heat, kind of. And overcome cold, kind of. So we're better than not being able to overcome it at all. But man, I'm so excited. I want to welcome you today to Victory Church on the Rock. If you're new, you might not know who I am. My name is Dustin, and I'm the lead pastor here, along with my wife here at Victory Church on the Rock. And you know, one thing that we want to do is maybe you are a guest with us today for the first time. Maybe you're here with us for the first time. What we want you to do is text the word hello to 587-807-0944. I think we have a slide for it as well. But to text hello to 587-807-0944. And we want to fill out that form. We'd love to give you a free coffee from Starbucks just for being here in the service with us today. So text that number. Text Text hello. We want to give that to you if it's your first time with us today. But today is our fall kickoff. I was so excited. Beth and I, I shut up this last week. And one thing you'll know about me probably already is I'm passionate. I'm excited. And I, we knew the fall that September was going to bring something beautiful. We knew that something was going to happen this September. And so we planned September 12th almost from when we started saying September 12th is going to be a day where we kick off into something that God has for us. Now what we're kicking off to, to be honest, we don't fully know. Right, because there's so much change and there's so much happening around us. This world is in chaos. But one thing I know is that God is going to do something here in our church. God is going to do something new in our church because September always brings new things. Right, for some of us, this will be the first time since we've had kids that we're going to be home alone with our kids because all our kids are in school. That's a big change for people. Some of us, we've been staying home with the kids for so long, now all of a sudden they're all in school and we're like, now I have all this time. What did I used to do with all this time, right? Like, I think, like, you know, Beth and I, we had, you know, our daughter's only just over one, so, but I still am like, what did we do with all our time? Like, what, like, I don't, I, fool, I still don't know what we did. And we thought we were busy, right? And now all of a sudden we have a baby and we're like, wow, this is what 6 a.m. looks like, you know? But things change all around us. You know, you know some of us, again, we, we're, we're, we're home alone with our kids for the first time. Some of us, we started university, right? University, some of us, we've actually moved out of our parents' house for the very first time. We were living on our own for the first time in a new city, in a new opportunity, in a new setting. And we're just trying to figure out what that's going to look like. September always brings changes. And I think all of us, we're looking for something to do, and we're looking for something to live for, and we're looking for something to die for. I think all of us, human, hum, human nature, we're all looking for something to give our life to, right? We're all looking for purpose. We're all looking for something that we can dedicate everything that we are, that we can use our talents, we can use our gifts, we can use ourselves to serve something bigger than us. You know, when someone asks you, what is your purpose here on this planet? Do you, do you have an answer to that question? Do you know what your purpose is here in this moment? Do you know what your purpose is? Some people, I've met a lot of people that actually have a mission statement for their life. Where they've actually looked at their life and said, you know what, I want to know what I'm about. So that way every decision that I make, every decision, everything that I do goes back to the core value of what my purpose actually is. So maybe that's something for you you can do is say, okay, when it comes down to the to what it is, what do I want my life to be about? What is my purpose here on this planet? Maybe that's something that you need to spend some time doing is even creating a mission statement for your life. What do I want to be alive? When you look at your life, what do you think you were created to do? What do you think you were created to do? And so we're starting this series today called Together We Go. And what this series is all about, it's, it's, it's seven 
uh, statements that we've created to help us when it comes to making decisions. Seven statements that, 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 that will help us when it comes to making decisions and what we're going to do in the future and, and all those kind of things. And these are the, this is what we believe Victory Church on the, on the Rock culture will be is these seven statements. And these are statements that I, I think will really help us, to be honest. You might hear them be like, wow, I already knew that. And that's cool. But I think for us, this is just going to help us. Maybe it's just going to help me fully understand what God is doing with us at Victory Church on the Rock. Because the reality is that culture, it's not taught. Culture is, it, it is caught. Right? So we, we can teach it all we want. And, and we see that, you know, the culture of your home, it's not something you teach. It's something that you do. And so we want these statements so that we're teaching to be something that we actually start to live out. And the first statement that we have is this statement, and it's so simple, it's Jesus is our purpose. You know, Jesus is our purpose. This is what I believe, obviously, we were created for, is we were created to serve Jesus. We were created for Jesus to be our purpose, for him to be what we were called to do. But how often does this purpose, as simple and how much we know it, how often is this not the reality in our life? How often do we deviate from Jesus being our purpose to our work being our purpose? How often do we deviate from Jesus being our purpose to our education being our purpose? How often do we deviate and say, no, no, my family is my purpose. And of course, your family is so important. But if Jesus is not the purpose of your family, I think things are going to begin to fall apart. Because Jesus has to be our purpose. He has to be. And there's a story in the Bible where, where we see this happen. There are three things that come out of the story that I think will help us when it comes to, as a church, making sure that we're always focused on Jesus being our purpose as well as helping us as individuals maintain the reality that Jesus is our purpose. So this is the story. We can read it in Matthew 14, 22. Verse, uh, yeah, 14, verse 22 says this. Immediately, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go out ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up to them on the mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land. It was buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. There was a little storm happening. Verse 25 says this. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. While the disciples saw him on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. So the first thought I have today is this, is that don't be scared of Jesus. Now I think when we see that, right, like, we're, like a lot of us were like, oh, I'm not scared of Jesus. No, no, he saved my life. He, he's amazing. But I think some of us were scared of what Jesus wants to do in our life. I think some of us were afraid of some of the things we might have to let go of when we, make, when we give our life to Jesus. I think some of us were, we might be afraid of the things that, that, might, that, that we let go of or the things that, that Jesus is calling us to that are just so big, so much bigger than we could ever imagine, that what happens is we actually start to get afraid. Because we're like, no, that's too big, Jesus. Like, like, like this, is, this is what I do. You know, I, this is my job. You're telling me to share the gospel? No, no, that's the pastor's job. Right? I'm just here. I'm doing my job. I'm going to church. I'm giving, you know, and it's awesome. But, but sometimes we have to let go of so much stuff because Jesus is saying, man, if you let go of this, there's something so much bigger for you. And sometimes that thought terrifi terrifies us so we're scared to fully give our life to Jesus because of what that, might, what that might do in our life, what that might change in our life. And so for a lot of us, what we might need to do, this is a church, as individuals, we might need to get rid of tradition. We might need to get rid of some of the things that, that, that we've been doing for so long that they become habit, they become tradition, rather than being real. So sometimes we need to even rethink everything about, about our relationship with Jesus. You know, I wanna go deeper. Because if, if all we do to grow in our relationship with Jesus is the exact same thing, eventually we're going to hit a ceiling. So my relationship with Beth, if all that Beth and I did was watch TV and binge watch Netflix and then sit on our phones the whole time, and that's all we ever did, we're never going to grow. But some of us, that's how we approach Jesus, right? We go to Jesus and we say, hey, I'm going to read my Bible. But while we're reading our Bible, we're also sending emails, 
right? We're, we're also spending some time and we're, we're, we're thinking about all the things that we have to do today rather than just taking a step back and saying, I'm gonna push away distraction. You know what we want our distraction to be? I would rather Jesus be my distraction than my phone be my distraction, right? I would rather Jesus be the thing that distracts me from work than something else. What if we were addicted to Jesus rather than technology? Right, what if we were addicted to spending time in his presence and learning more about him? If, if we were addicted to that, how much more fruitful would our life be? That's what I think Jesus is saying, man, man, I am your purpose. As a church, as an individual, I am your purpose. Because sometimes having Jesus as our purpose is scary because we won't be comfortable. You know, I think, you know, Sometimes you hear people say, oh man, when I gave my life to Jesus, everything was so much better. And that's, a, that's awesome. But there's a lot of things when I gave my life to Jesus that became challenging. What people thought about me. You know, when I, when I, when I took the call and became a pastor, my, some of my family was like, are you stupid? For real. And we have to, sometimes, you know, following Jesus is not always comfortable. It's not always comfortable. We might even be scared of him and what he can do in our life. But, but, but we don't have to be afraid. Because Jesus encourages us, right? It says, but then, verse 27, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Take courage. So what happens is, is that Jesus encourages us. And what encourage means is to actually put courage inside of somebody. Because you know what? They were still afraid. But he said, no. I'm going to put courage inside of you so that way you can start walking in the life I've created you to live. That's what he's trying to do in our life is to give us the courage we need to actually do everything he's calling us to do. He says, take courage. Courage to overcome any obstacle. Courage to push past fear. Courage to do things we could have never imagined. He is the one who will push you into your future, but he encourages you in your hardest moment. Right, I'm telling you, you know, Beth and I, we obviously made this call and we came to Edmonton. There's been a lot of moments where we've been terrified, to be honest, right? I don't know if you've ever gotten a new job or moved to a different province, moved to a different city. There's a lot of fear that sometimes can creep in. We can be afraid. We can be scared, even though we know this is what we're supposed to do. Fear sometimes still creeps in. And what happens is we feel like we're alone. We think... Jesus says, don't be afraid. Why, why am I afraid? Why, why am I scared? Why, you know, I know that Jesus is calling me to do this, but why am I so scared? And he says, no, don't be afraid. I will give you courage. I will encourage you in your deepest, hardest moment. Jesus needs to be our purpose. We can't be scared of what people think. We have to pursue Jesus with everything that we have. That is what I believe our church is about. Jesus is our purpose. And then the story, uh, verse 28 says this, Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. You know, I think when we look at that, right, when we're afraid, we don't tell our fear usually to take us closer. Right? Like if you say, say you're afraid of fights. I went to the CN Tower one time. They have this like elephant proof glass you can see down below. Uh, that was the glass I was standing about here because I'm scared. And oftentimes with fear, right, when, when fear is in front of us, that's not the direction we typically want to go, right? Right? Like, 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 okay, I'm terrified, right, of, of some of these things. Like, okay, bees, right, wasps, we talked about it. I'm terrified of them. My, my biggest reaction is that, you know what I need to do? I need to go to a wasp nest. That's what I really need to do. But, but Peter, I think he had this moment of realizing the, the closer he can get to Jesus, the less afraid he will be. The closer that we can get to Jesus, the less afraid we'll be. We might be in the presence of our biggest fear, but if Jesus is in the room, we don't have to be afraid. Because I'm telling you, fear is not going to just vanish in a moment. We need to be comfortable in the presence of our fear and the presence of our Savior at the same time. We bring him with us to our fear. Some of us, we, we're so scared and then we go to the wrong thing. And, and the second thought I have today is that we need to call out to him. We need to call out to Jesus when things are getting hard. What is your first response? Is your first response alcohol? 
Do you rely on a substance to overcome anxiety or do you rely on your Savior? Our first response can't be a substance or anything because then our purpose actually shifts from Jesus to a joint. From our perfect God to pornography. Jesus needs to be our first response in trouble. But we all know how hard that is. You know, I think we like to talk about it for some of us, right? When hard times come, usually... Usually our response is not, Jesus, I need you. It's, Jesus, why aren't you here? Right? We, we, we sit here and we say, Jesus, where were you? Where are you? Rather than saying, Jesus, I need you. You know, and Jesus, we need to learn to call out to him like Peter did. You know, Peter was scared. Right? Just moments before, he's scared. He sees this ghost walking on water. And Peter's first thought was, I need to go to that voice. I'm going to walk on water today. Right? And you imagine, right? The other disciples, they're scared too. Peter's like, hey, tell me to come out on the water with you. And Jesus is like, come. Like, sure, dude. Like, come on ahead. And the other disciples, right, they probably said, Peter, what are you doing? Like, don't get out of the boat. Like, you're going to drown. You're going to die. Like, don't get out of the boat. You're, you're not Jesus. You can't walk on water. You can't do this. That's the voices that were around him. And Peter said, I'm going to push away the voices. I'm going to step out of the boat. I'm going to call out to my Savior. And I'm going to do something I could never have imagined I ever could do. We need to learn how to call out to Jesus. And I remember when Beth was pregnant. There were several times where we didn't know if our daughter was going to make it. There was multiple, multiple times we didn't know if our daughter was going to make it. Now, I don't know if you've ever been through a moment like that, but there was, there was times where we ended up in emergency. It happened twice. There, we had an emergency ultrasound where we went in, and they said, hey, we're booking you for an ultrasound tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. And I remember we, we didn't know. We didn't even know what to do. And just to be completely honest with you, this is just me being honest. Jesus was, was the, not the person I wanted to go to. Because, again, my response in that moment was, <laughs> Jesus, where are you? This was a real moment for us. We didn't know if she was going to make it. I remember we had a lot of fear. I can't speak specifically for her, but there was a lot of fear that I had. You know, we hear stories uh, of some of the things that can happen, and, and we were starting to live our deepest nightmare. Fear that we would lose our precious baby. Fear that I could maybe lose my wife. Fear that there would be serious complications. And I wanted to turn so badly to everyone else to overcome the anxiety, to turn to a substance or to turn to something. But I remember I just took a moment and I said, God, I don't understand. But God, I, I trust you. And I think for me, that's when peace came. See, see a substance will only provide peace for a short moment. It only should provide peace for maybe a night, maybe an hour, maybe a week. But eventually, it's going to leave you feeling more empty than you've ever been. And I wouldn't have been able to go through this moment alone if I wasn't able to just call out to God. Now, I don't know your circumstance. I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know the storm around you. I don't know what's happening. I don't. For some of you, I might know a little bit. For a lot of us, I think all of us have something happening right now. And we've been doing our best to not call out. We've been doing our best to not reach out. We've been doing our best to not ask for help. We've been doing our best to try and overcome it by ourselves. I want to encourage you, even today, when you go home, just call out to Jesus. He wants to help you. He wants you, he wants you to be able to walk on the top of your fear, not drown in your fear. And I believe that that is who Jesus and what Jesus is trying to do in our lives and in our church. He's saying, hey, let's stomp on our fear. Let's not drown in it. You know, Peter, he fixated his eyes and saw a miracle. If you need a miracle right now, and I think a lot of us, we need a miracle right now. If you need a miracle right now, call out to Jesus. God is a God of miracles. God is a God who brings healing. 
God is a God who provides. God is a God who can help you pay off your debt. God is a God who can help you overcome your addiction. That is who the God we serve. And we need to start to realize that. It's so easy to say it, but it's so hard to believe it. We need to start to believe that God is a God of miracles. We cannot overcome in our own strength. We will never be able to do it. If you want to overcome your deepest fear, bring Jesus into the picture. Allow him to speak to you. Allow him to be there for you. Allow him to be there. He will help you deal with your deepest wounds and and he will be there in your biggest victories. And that's exactly what happens next in this story. Verse 30, but when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. Cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. See, Peter, when his, when his focus changed, that's when he began to sink into his fear. It's all about focus, right? Because Whatever we focus on, we say this, but whatever you focus on, if you're focusing on what you're afraid of, you're going to sink. But if you're focusing on Jesus, he will allow you to overcome everything. All the things that that, that have been weighing you down, the things that have got you caught up in Vought 3 is this, let him lift you up. Are you letting him lift you up? You know, Jesus, right? In this moment, Peter says, hey, I need help. Jesus could have thrown him like a swimmer's manual, right? Like here's a swimmer's manual, just read it. It's like a bit long, read it. It's like 12 pages, read it out. Oh, that should help you, right? And sometimes, sometimes we're, we're trying to overcome things the wrong way. Because again, we think, I think as humans, we think that we are so independent and so tough and so good and so good at what we do that we think we can do it on our own. But Peter, he full on panicked, right? He began to sink. He, he was just like, he turned into like a child. He's like, save me right now. I need help. And Jesus says, immediately reached out his hand and grabbed him. We need to call, cry out for help. And we have to let him lift us up. Some of us, we, we, we try and push Jesus aside. We say, no, I can do it. I'm tough. I'm strong enough. But Jesus will always lift you up. He will lift you out of the things that you put yourself into. He will lift you up out of the regret. He will lift you up out of guilt. He will lift you up out of everything that we put ourselves in. Jesus will lift you up. And I believe, now this this is what I believe. I believe that Jesus will lift us up as a church, as a beacon in our city. As a lighthouse in our city. A place for people to find connection. A place for people to find friends. For people to give Jesus their life. And allow him to give them purpose. I believe that God will lift us up as a place where people can find healing. They can find vision. And they can find love. That's what I believe God is doing in our church. And I know he's already done that in our church over the past almost 30 years. But I believe right now the purpose of the local church and the hope of the world is actually in the local church. Especially right now coming in the middle of COVID and coming out of COVID. The local church is the hope of the world because Jesus is our purpose. Jesus has to be our purpose. What do you believe Jesus is lifting you into this year? What do you think Jesus has for you next? Pursue him and let him elevate you even if what he's taking you to is uncomfortable. As humans, we want to be comfy. That's why people pay thousands of dollars to sit first class on airplanes. Even if they fly to Vancouver, it's like, it's like an hour flight. We want to be comfortable, right? We buy big, comfy beds. We have like 70 pillows on our beds that we take off every night. It's kind of weird, right? We want to be comfortable. We want to have a good job. We want to have good pay, which is great. But what if God is calling you to be a missionary, where you might not be as comfortable as what you used to be? What if God is calling you to move cities and give up your house and give up what you had and move somewhere new for something different? What if God is calling you to go back to school and get a different education? What if God is calling you to a place that's not comfy anymore? 
or God is calling you to be generous and give away a lot of money, what if? Now, I don't know what God is lifting you into. I cannot say that. But I think sometimes the, 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 the issue that can happen is that when we start to be uncomfortable, when we start to get too comfortable, that's when we realize it's time to do something different. Oftentimes being comfortable is actually the spirit speaking to you saying, hey, I got something different for you, something new for you, something bigger for you. Maybe it's time to do something new. Maybe it's time to let go of something old. Maybe it's time to let go and let him lead you even if you don't know where you're going. I remember when God moved Beth and I here to Edmonton to to become here the lead pastors and we were scared, we were nervous. But we believe that God was lifting us up into something bigger and better than we could have ever imagined. You know, to be honest, in Calgary, we were comfy. We were so comfortable. We knew everything. I knew how to get around. Now I say, hey, where do you live? Like, oh, I live on like 76th Avenue and like 50th Street. It's like, why did I even ask? Like, I don't know what that is. Everything's Northwest. And like, it just is so confusing to me. And, you know, in Calgary, I knew where to go. I knew where everything was. Now you have to use a GPS everywhere I go. Right? But we had to let go of what was good to let God lead us to what was best. And you know what? You might be living in a place where everything's good, right? Things are great for you. But God is saying, no, this isn't what's best for you. Yeah, you're comfy right now. Yeah, you, you're doing great things. But I have something bigger. I have something better. I have something that's going to be amazing for you in the future. I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up here. But as we, as we close this service, this is my prayer for us, is that today we can rededicate our lives to Jesus as our purpose. That we can sit here and say, Jesus, we're turning our eyes back to you. We can't focus on the waves. We can't focus on the storm. Because then our purpose becomes survival. It doesn't become Jesus, right? If our purpose is just surviving, I don't think we're living in the place God has for us. I believe that God wants us and Jesus wants us to focus on him so that way we're not just surviving. That way we're thriving and thriving not in a place of like wealth, but thriving in a place of purpose. You know, we sometimes feel our purpose is prosperity and money and it's not. But how easy does it get changed into that? Jesus is our purpose. He has to be or we we aren't being the church. Right? If Jesus isn't our purpose here, you guys are coming to a TED Talk. Right? We're here at a social club. We come hang out because we're all friends. But Jesus has to be our purpose. And you know what happens is when Jesus is our purpose, there will be moments where, where, where you're doing something and somebody say, hey, I noticed this and I feel like you're struggling. Or hey, maybe, maybe this is something about you that maybe is a blind spot for you. When Jesus is our purpose, we can approach that and say, we can be humble and say, yeah, we're not perfect. And I think when we come to church, some of us, we we try and pretend that we're perfect, right? We pretend that our life, everything's going great. And maybe for you, you know, maybe you're like, yeah, my life's great right now. That's awesome. But for some of us, we're coming here and we're pretending. And I, I don't think God created the local church for us to pretend, to be honest. You know, when Jesus says, my bride is the church, I don't think he wants the church to be pretenders. I think he wants the church to be contenders. People who do something big, who reach people, who reach the lost, who, who, who can build slum, build schools in slums and see children who have never met Jesus find, finally find a free education. We are the local church. And Jesus is our purpose. And it has to be. But with Jesus as our purpose, we can go anywhere and we can go where he needs us to be and he will give us the courage we need. Again, if you want to re-bring that to your life, three thoughts today. Number one, don't be scared of Jesus. Number two, we have to call out to him. And number three, let him lift you up. I'm going to pray for us today. But before I do, one thing that we like to do as part of our service is we like to give an opportunity for anyone online or anyone here with us today 
an opportunity to, to give Jesus their life, to make that decision. Maybe today you want to give, make Jesus the big purpose of your life for the first time. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. You've heard about him before. You, you've, you've heard about who he is, but you've never actually made that decision. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. We want to give you a moment to do that today. And all you have to do is pray this simple prayer, this prayer of Jesus, I give you my life. And just pray that right now. You can whisper to him, whether you're on your couch, at home, or you're sitting here in these chairs. Just whisper that, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. I give you all that I am. I give you my fear. I, I give you my, my anxiety. I give you my depression. I give you my addiction. I give you all that I am. And Jesus, I want you to be my purpose. Jesus, I give you my life. You know, maybe you made that decision today. You said, Jesus, I give you my life. Maybe for the first time, I just want to encourage everyone, close your eyes, bow your heads. So let that this be a moment where people can be courageous and just stick up their hand and say, yeah, that's me. I gave Jesus my life today. Maybe that's you. Just put up your hand wherever you're at. Maybe if you're online, write that in the chat. Just write that prayer. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. I'm going to give one more opportunity. If that's you today, put up your hand in this place. I would love to pray for you. Be courageous. Be bold. There's a hand right there. Yeah. Beautiful. We give you our lives today, Jesus. Father, I thank you for our friends who gave their lives to you today. God, we celebrate with them. God, we say, this is a beautiful moment in history. The best decision that we could ever make. God, I pray that you bless them. And God, I pray for us as a church right now in this moment. God, today we as a church, we rededicate our lives to you. We rededicate our vision to you. We rededicate our church to you and say, Jesus, you are our purpose. Nothing else is our purpose except for you. You are why we are here. You are her, who we serve. And God, I pray that today, that as we pray, God, I pray that our, that our church will be a lighthouse in this city where people who are lost can find a way, where people who are broken can find you, where people who need you will find you. God, I pray that that is who we are and that is who we will continue to be. In Jesus' name, amen.